That's a very, very generous introduction by John. Um, I, I wish I was that person. Um, and the biography, I, I looked at it, and I was slightly embarrassed by that. It, but it was written by my mother, so uh, <laughs> you'll have to forgive me or her. But uh, look, I, I feel like a gatecrasher because I'm not a security professional. I don't have the level of knowledge and expertise that you have. Uh, I am just a barrister, and in the course of my work, I had the good fortune to get involved in some fascinating cases. And so I'd just like to share some of those experiences with you. The real expertise was behind me, people like you who, who just pointed me in the right direction, told me what to say, and that's what I did. And so what I'm going to do is, these are some of the cases which I was involved in. Some of them you, you may be familiar with uh, or, or not, but the first one, and they were all fascinating cases in, in each and every way. Uh, I ended up um, prosecuting. I d didn't defend these guys. I prosecuted them, but every time I prosecuted these guys, I almost had some amount of respect for them, thinking, well, they're about a third my age. They remind me of my son, and I started to worry what he was doing in his bedroom uh, on his laptop. Uh, but I was fascinated by their world, a world which I am never going to be a part of. That world is the future. I, I am very much of the past. Um, in some ways, I'm glad to say, having heard all about the botnets and how dangerous they're going to be in the future. So the first chap I want to introduce you to uh, is, a, well, first, Facebook. Some years ago, there was a hack of Facebook. I don't know if you read about it, heard about it, or not. Uh, Facebook tried to keep it very quiet uh, with their legion of lawyers. Uh, uh, because it was at a sensitive time for Facebook. Uh, and, and, but the hack was carried out by um, Glenn Mangum. Now, Glenn Mangum, uh, in 2011, was 26, lived at home like a lot of these guys do, uh, and he was able to hack into Facebook from his uh, bedroom. Uh, at the time, there was uproar in the United States because the US authorities, Facebook, thought it was the Chinese. The Chinese had carried out some sophisticated uh, industrial espionage. At the time, it was uh, described as the most extensive and grave case of social media hacking uh, ever to come before a British court. Um, and in due course, young Glenn was sentenced to eight months in imprisonment, much to the horror of the American authorities, because uh, the district attorney at Silicon Valley uh, was desperate to get a hold of his hands on this case. And so there was a request for extradition of Glenn. And everyone knows about Gary McKinnon and what happened in relation to him. And the British authorities did not want another Gary McKinnon situation arising, and I'm grateful that we fought off their challenges because the district attorney had promised Facebook and the Americans that um, young Glenn would get at least 80 years in prison in an, uh, in an American penitentiary. He only received eight months prison, which I, even though I prosecuted, I thought it was the right sentence for Glenn. And uh, what he did, was stole uh, Facebook source code. Um, at the time, Facebook refused to accept that that was the case um, for reasons which I will come to. So the Americans were looking for this person. Uh, they thought, well, this must be the, the hacker, but this is Glenn. Um, and you look at him and you think, well, he's fresh-faced. Really, and, 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 and not a hacker. Glenn was probably the brightest, most ingenious hacker I, I prosecuted by far. Uh, before fa Facebook, he'd hacked Yahoo, but it, it, only those in the online community knew about it. He told Yahoo he'd hacked them, but Yahoo wouldn't believe it. Uh, so then he went on to hack Facebook. Um, uh, and they had to believe him because he, he, uh, he did. What did he do? Well, very simply, Facebook has a 
test called Puzzle Server, or did have, I don't know if they still do, and it's a challenge to uh, hackers or whoever. If you pass the Puzzle Server, you go to the next stage, and you might even be offered uh, an interview with uh, Facebook. Uh, Glenn took it a little bit further than that. He found that there was a, a vulnerability in the puzzle server. So he passed the test. He, he was always going to. But he found a vulnerability, and so he took advantage of that. And through that vulnerability, he accessed the private side. And then later on, he hijacked an employee's email account uh, and the persona of that employee in the technical department, and then fired off emails from that account to the technical department of Facebook, who in due course embedded his software into the Facebook server, which in then due course relayed the source code to Glenn's uh, desktop computer in England, which he saved on a hard drive. Um, he, he, he never did it for profit. He simply did it for the intellectual challenge. Uh, and that was his methodology. This is what I asked the officers to produce to me so that I could give it to the judge and the jury so we could better understand it. You won't be able to see it, uh, but it, it, it helped me understand what was going on. The reality was, when uh, Glenn was interviewed by uh, the... Uh, as it then was a serious and organized crime agency officers, and they had some two experts there to, to question him because the officers didn't know what they really... Uh, it soon transpired that what happened was that Glenn gave them a tutorial, uh, and, and then they would go away afterwards and say, all right, they'll check, we'll, we'll stop now, we'll check, go away, check what Glenn has said, uh, and then they'll go back to him and say, well, yes, but can you just explain this, because we don't understand this. And Glenn, being who he was, uh, uh, and being unable to lie, so he just had, uh, he was on the spectrum, and he had certain Asperger's, so he was unable to lie. Uh, and so he would explain how he did this. There was no obfuscation by him, but it was a fantastic um, interview, because um, he was basically teaching these experienced technical people, what he did, how he did it, and so forth. Uh, and as I said, he was able to gain access by hijacking uh, the identity of an employee by that process. And so what happened? Well, the FBI in the United States uh, Department of Justice, well, they, they spent a lot of time and effort trying to find out who it was. It, it wasn't, didn't prove difficult because um, Glenn was using uh, his, his ISP from his home, and so the FBI quickly tracked him down uh, and told the authorities here. Um, Facebook spent a lot of money, uh, but they, what they were most concerned about was public confirmation that Glenn had got away with the uh, source code. As I say, they never would accept that that's what happened. Uh, and why? Well, at the time, Facebook was about to uh, uh, float on the stock market, and so it was going to be desperate to protect that flotation. That was its value then. I think it was uh, half a trillion in 2017. I think it's taken a dip last year, but still a very, very valuable company. And obviously, Facebook didn't want it to be publicly known that young Glenn, from his home computer, did what he did, uh, which is a source code. Now, in due course, um, I had to explain to the judge, well, he asked me, uh, what does, what source code? And so I regurgitated the um, sentence or two that I was fed by the technical people uh, and his lordship looked at me and, and didn't register. So I used by way of analogy. And um, I'm going to throw this out to you because um, I, I, I use Coca-Cola recipe. Uh, and his lordship just looked at me quizzically uh, and didn't register. I don't think he drank Coca-Cola. <laughs> um, but if I asked you, being put on the spot in the high court, so, well, I've given the answer. So by way of comparison, would, what would, any good suggestions? <laughs> we, 
were you there in London when I gave this last time? <laughs> well, that's, that's actually what crossed my mind uh, when uh, I thought, well, what's the next one? And I thought, Colonel Sanders' KFC recipe. Um, I, I almost, but then I had this image of his lordship, and I thought, no, he's not going to order a bargain bucket. Uh, <laughs> And, and I'm glad I didn't say it, but, but I thought, brilliant. And I thought, the first thought was, no, that's not brilliant, because he would have just... Le-. And so I continued to try and explain to him what the source code was, and it, it just didn't register. It just didn't register. I just said, look, it, it's everything that Facebook is. It's, it's at the very core of its identity in business. Uh, and without it, if it got out, then it would not really have... Uh, any value because it's, it's the intellectual property. But the challenges, well, uh, the US authorities, prosecuting authorities, um, uh, as I say, they wanted to extradite Glenn uh, and we were glad that we fought that off. I think that was the right thing uh, because he would still be in prison uh, even now. Facebook, well, they, they were not very helpful uh, everything we had to go through the Facebook lawyers. Uh, they were always involved in every decision. Uh, and it was an arduous and challenging process, if I could put it that way. Uh, as I say, they were non committal about what had actually happened. And they were desperate that everything should be done behind closed doors, secrecy, and so forth. And we just said, well, that's not how it's done here. Uh, um, we do it our way, you do it your way, uh, and that's the way it is. So that was Glenn. Um, I hope he is well somewhere. Uh, the, uh, the rumor was that he's probably working for Facebook or security industry. I hope he's working for the intelligence agencies because he was by far the brightest young man uh, I came to prosecute. Now, I also prosecuted Anonymous. Everyone knows about Anonymous, don't they? Do you remember some years ago, the activists with the Guido Fawkes mask, and they carried out loads of denial of service attacks on organizations here in America, especially the FBI, CIA, PayPal, etc. And they were a highly organized bunch of young guys. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be involved in two of the, the prosecutions in this country. And uh, again, uh, Teenagers, very young men. And one of their operations was Operation Yukon. Uh, and it was a denial of uh, service attacks on various organizations, essentially against those copyright uh, uh, agencies protecting, because they all believed that everything should be free and disseminated on the internet, music, literature, etc. cetera. Um, not unlike any young people in any other given age, really, just that the youth of today can rebel on the internet uh, like uh, we used to be able to, or I used to be able to do. Uh, and so they carried out a number of attacks and there was a long widespread investigation and involving many, many jurisdictions, over 50. Uh, and the answer was, we are legion, we are everywhere. <laughs> It's typical, isn't it? It's rather like a football chart, but, uh, but they caused a lot of damage in their, in their time. We had a lot of challenges, pre challenges. I won't get into this. There are lo- lots of slides, as John has said, and conscious of the time. And so I'll flick through these. This was their uh, payback homepage, so very organized. You can join them. Um, they used... Uh, coordinate their attacks with the usual things, internet relay chat site, channels and so forth. And one of the chaps was called uh, Christopher Weatherhead. He hired the, their servers in, and, and they were domiciled in Russia. He used to access them through uh, this Gmail uh, account, which he used at the University of Northampton, which he attended as a student. And that's how he was tracked. That's how they got him, and then that's how they got the... Uh, <laughs> see, always make a mistake, rather like Glenn using the ISP. He used his university email account to set up the Spokes account. There was an IRC interface. These were the postings they used to make. So these were the coordinated attacks, invitations to, for anyone who wanted to, to, to attack. Uh, and so it was Visa, 
uh, MasterCard, uh, the US Copyright Office. There was also a rumor that they were going to attack Amazon, but the, the word was that they decided not to because they wouldn't get their Christmas presents. Uh, so they didn't do that from their parents because it was just before Christmas. <laughs> so they, they held off on that attack. DDoS is very simple, as everyone knows. Caused a lot of damage across the world. Um, and it was a real challenging case, really was, and it was fascinating. They used a tool called a, a, a low-orbit ion cannon, which is a simple, and this, this was the interface and how to operate and plan it. Just join it and get involved. And it was, again, fascinating. This was a, an extract of one of the many chat logs. You can't see it, but just there, in the very three quarters away down is Christopher Weatherhead giving instructions to anyone who's in the beehive to carry out an attack. That's how we got him in, in the trial, because he said he was, he was giving a tutorial to people. Uh, but we said, well, no, you're a third year computer uh, uh, graduate. You know, still, you, that's, you're not giving tutorials. Uh, uh, and he was convicted. There was all sorts of other uh, splinter groups and it, too many to go through. Christopher Weatherhead was called Nerdo, and there were 200,000 pages of chat, which fortunately I didn't go through, but the officers did in order to identify the evidence. Results, unprecedented success, all down to the hard work of people behind me uh, and convictions. Uh, and one of the chaps I remember was Jake Davis. I don't know if you know Jake Davis, have you heard of him? He was called, he, he was known as um, Topery. He ran the operations department, a young man, and they had to send a plane out to him, a private jet, because he was based in the Shetlands. And he said it was the best day of his life because his parents had abandoned him. And so all he did was spend all his time on the computer. And so because, and, and so he had a private jet with the, the serious and organized crime agency with him being flown down to London. He said that was the best thing that ever happened to him. Um, he's now a cybersecurity consultant. You can check him out on the internet. And he's a fascinating guy. He now advises Twitter on, and hacks for them, you know, as an ethical hacker and, and so forth. Um, so I remember him. Now, Seth, I'm going to move to a young man called Seth, conscious of the time. Seth, at the age of 13, set up a botnet. Uh, by the time he was 16, when he was arrested, he was quite an accomplished hacker. He was not a hacktivist like the others, uh, but in March 2013, he carried out a series of DDoS attacks against the Spam House Project, you know, the anti-spam organization, which had a worldwide impact on a number of associated internet exchanges, including links. And as a result of the disruption of his attacks, which began beginning in March 2013 and escalated in magnitude. Uh, it started with something like 16 gigabytes per second, but it ended up being 300 gigabytes per second by the end. He just escalated, escalated it. And every time Spam House and Cloudflare tried to remediate, uh, he just was able to increase. And so um, it's quite a, uh, it's a fascinating case. At the time, it was the largest DDoS attack, and it was. Uh, 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 you know, evocatively called um, uh, the, the cyber attacks, which almost broke the internet by the times. Uh, again, um, he was a young man. He carried out the attacks from his South London home, his bedroom. He, ne he never left the bedroom, it seems. His mother said that uh, she would leave his breakfast at the door. He would eat it. Then she would collect it. And that was his life. But he was a remarkable young man, and I conscious of the time, and there was a lot of detail about how he did it, uh, carried out um, these attacks. And so I think it's the best thing to do is these slides will be made available to everyone. If anyone wants to, they can read for themselves. Uh, as you can see. So I'll just quickly flick through these. Uh, Cost a lot of money to, to the victims. You can, see, you can see the figures for yourself. No one knows how much it costs because um, uh, a lot, well, the, the impact was world global at the time. 
catching Seth, well, um, there's no photograph of him because he's too young. He wasn't not, not allowed to show you who he is. Um, it was a joint operation between the, the UK and the Dutch law enforcement authorities. He's known as Narco Online. Uh, and uh, during the attacks, he uploaded a screenshot of the DDoS program to his online image sharer. And that's how we were able to catch him, the IP address. He used to do that, relocated to his home address. <laughs> so again, brilliant, but again, well, just naive and young. And there was other things that we were able to match with. So challenges, his computer was open, showing numerous active virtual machines with global connections, including Ukraine. Data extraction, you can see for yourselves. 43 IP addresses and IP spoofing. Had 27 servers in countries without mutual assistance. Uh, and 1 million lines of chat evidence. That's, um, and multiple online identities. Uh, he pleaded guilty. Also discovered uh, that um, Seth also had a sideline. He was a hired gun. And he made it publicly known he's a hired gun because it transpired when they looked into his computer to see the chat logs and so forth that since the age of 13, he carried out DDoS attacks uh, for reward, mostly with Russian, Eastern European clients, some in the Middle East, and they would pay him to take down the websites of their competitors. And he started that at the age of 13 and um, when they looked more into how much money he made, um, well, on his arrest at 16, um, he had 50,000 pounds in his NatWest account. Um, they, the, the bank statement showed that he always had a balance of 30,000 pounds in his NatWest bank account. I'm not sure how he's able to do it at 13, 16. The bank manager must have, <laughs> parents had no idea. Um, <laughs> I still can't figure out how he was able to get away with the KYC. Um, uh, he had 10 Liberty Reserve accounts, you know those, uh, showing at least 200,000 pounds had gone through those. He had multiple PayPal accounts. He also had Bitcoin accounts and so forth. We never got to the bottom of how much money he really made. And I know some have heard this, but the, when the police went to to the home address and said to Seth's mother, look, you know, uh, your boy isn't, you know, been very naughty. Um, <laughs> uh, and they explained to her what he'd been up to. Her first reaction was of just outrage, not because of what he'd been doing, but the first reaction was, wait until I get my hands on the little bugger, because... Um, she'd been paying for his uh, Russian language exam. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, <laughs> when she'd found out that he'd be making these large amounts of money. Now, um, Seth again was a fascinating young man. Actually, one of the things, was, I'll just finish on this point. He, he actually came, at the age of 16, he posted that he was fed up of ruining people's lives and businesses, and he wanted to get out of the game. Uh, 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 but his, his customer base was so widespread, they continued to assist. He carried on, and he was quite fearful of some of the, the people he'd worked for, especially the Russians, because he thought, well, look, you know, they're going to blackmail me and so forth. So he was quite relieved, rather like Jake Davis, quite relieved that it had all come to an end. But between the age of 13 to 16, he must have made, well, it's anyone's guess. Um, he, he, again, I was quite grateful. He, he didn't receive a prison sentence, and, and nor should he have. He was a young man with problems, as, as some of them always, well, these guys always are, but he had problems. And hopefully he's doing well now. Because again, um, an ingenious young man, um, like all of them are. So those are three of my cases, which I've been, uh, on another occasion, if I see you again, I'll, t I'll speak to you, tell you about. 
Chelsea, the Sri Lankan, young Sri Lankan man. He was behind Dark Market. Um, but um, thank you for listening. I promised you it would be a fascinating talk, and for that I've kept five minutes in my pocket for you, Sandra, uh, to take any questions. No, would you absolutely. be happy to do Ab that? Please. The floor's uh, yours. If, if anyone questions? Any it's a one and only chance to question a barrister, <laughs> normally the other way around. Uh, at no cost. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Hi, Jason Kingston again, uh, Cube Thinking. Question here in the evolving world that we're learning more about neurodiversity. There's a common denominator appearing with some of your, the people that you prosecuted with regards to their presence on the spectrum. Bearing this in mind and looking as we learn more by way of neurodiversity and otherwise, are there opportunities to sway people before they've done a deviant act and to funnel them at a younger age? I know there's been stuff done in Germany um, to identify people who are on the spectrum and to funnel them in the correct way, but has there been any cross learnings from what you have seen? Yes, no, that's, that, that's a very good question and it's, it's a very um, topical theme. Um, I, the National Crime Agency may, produced a report, I think, early last year identifying the sort of typical characteristics of a hacker. And they'd usually be for a certain age range that sometimes, especially with the young men, they would have certain characteristics and so forth. And, and uh, the recommendations in that report were that, um, that it, 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 if one could identify these young men uh, and target them and divert them away from uh, these um, sort of criminality, because very often it's not a question of they're not criminals, really. They just not. Uh, they don't fully appreciate. So Jake Davis, for example, if you watch him on the, you know, he will explain to you why he did this. And he said, you get sucked into this world in the, on the internet, uh, and it draws you in. And it becomes their reality, uh, and therefore uh, it, it's what they know, and they don't really know, uh, appreciate uh, uh, the consequences of their actions. Um, and so there are, I, I know, uh, there are lots of uh, uh, initiatives to deal with that. Um, I was in Israel last year, and Israel has a very uh, positive and, and active recruitment policy in relation to this to deal with uh, their cyber defenses. And I know in the Far East they do this and so forth. And I'm sure they do that here and have started to do that in any event. One more. Uh, I see a hand right at the back. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, it's Dave Cousins from Barclays. Just a question regarding uh, rehabilitation, really. The, um, obviously, with all the, um, the young men you mentioned, they, they may have had issues and they may have ended up helping um, governments or intelligence agencies going forward. Uh, is, do you get involved in any planning or uh, processes within the judicial system to make this more formal or organized? Oh, well, no, because my involvement stops at the very time, moment that, that, that the defendant is dealt with. So, if, for example, um, when Glenn was sentenced to two years in imprisonment and uh, uh, he appealed, and so that's when uh, we were before the High Court, the Court Appeal, and his sentence was reduced because of his uh, personal mitigation. Um, it ends then. And so, um, so far as the criminal justice system is concerned, its involvement with these uh, people just finishes then. And so far as the state is concerned, there isn't any sort of system where we'd say, well, look, someone like Glenn, or indeed Seth, or Jake Davis, or so forth, we should be using their talents, harnessing their talents for better. Um, so no, there, are, there isn't that uh, process that I'm aware of. But it, it w would be very, very useful, bearing in mind what I've been listening to about uh, uh, during the course of this day, uh, about uh, the real uh, fears of, of the internet. Sandy, thank you very much Not indeed sure, for sharing your professional knowledge and uh, some of the good news. Thank you.
Great to have you here.